Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to you, depending which time zone you are in. Today, we'll have Andrew with our Jakarta Tech Talk today on utilizing microprofile health checks in a cloud environment. So without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Andrew. Hi, hopefully you can <laughs> hear me clearly. Uh, right, so yeah, my name uh, is Andrew Pilaj, uh, and this is Microprofile Health Cloud Demo, uh, showing, uh, giving a quick overview of uh, using Microprofile Health in uh, a cloud environment. So there's my details. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Java developer at Pyara Services. Uh, you can contact me on Twitter there, though I never look at it. Um, so just a little bit of background first. So cloud obviously uh, has essentially become the industry trend uh, uh, in the recent years for hosting your web applications right in comparison to uh, hosting them on premises on literal hardware you have in your uh, office or in a server rack somewhere. Uh, the reasoning for that is there's a numerous ones, but it's got a lower bar of entry because uh, you don't actually have to spend thousands of pounds or dollars on uh, buying out a massive server rack and setting it all up. Uh, that's not to say that cloud is necessarily cheaper. Uh, depending on how you use it, it can be more expensive. Uh, it's cheaper with asterisks. Uh, but it brings various other benefits as well, such as easier setup and maintenance, easier scaling, just because of the fact that it's all done essentially via uh, interface and uh, the various cloud platforms are actually dealing with uh, all the groundwork for you. Uh, so some of the cloud platforms you've probably heard of, uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, Azure, which is done by Microsoft and Google Cloud Platform, which is obviously done by Google. Uh, but then there's also uh, containers and orchestrators, as I like to call them. I don't know if they've got a technical name or not, uh, which is things like Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, these are, again, come, uh, very much coming into popularity in recent years, uh, where in comparison to having uh, full VMs, uh, even in the cloud, uh, you instead have containers, which have some advantages. The, the, the main one being that they're less, um, they are less susceptible to just small variations in the environment. There's the quite famous uh, meme or joke of, uh, it works on my machine, then we shall ship your machine. Uh, and that is how Docker was made, essentially. Um, but there's those, and then there's also some of the uh, other services uh, provided either by Amazon or by other companies such as Red Hat. Uh, there's OpenShift and Fargate, which tend to be uh, kind of hybrid things of OpenShift, particularly is using Kubernetes on uh, uh, in Red Hat's cloud environment. And uh, Fargate, again, is a kind of slightly different take on using it. It's a serverless thing rather than setting up a full VMs and managing them via the AWS EC2 console. So microservices as well, uh, as one of the, just a very quick background of that. Uh, again, popular architecture seen as the, or seen as one of the go-tos and uh, architectures for cloud environments. Uh, the reasoning being that uh, in comparison to a monolith or uh, which has one or very few uh, apps, um, big apps with multiple moving parts and layers. Uh, microservices are intended to be a lot smaller and more focused uh, to give easier maintenance and greater flexibility. Um, it's not always uh, necessarily a good thing to be using microservices, particularly if you're actually moving across from an existing monolithic app. There are many pitfalls which are frequently fallen into. Uh, the biggest one probably just being that you are moving from a monolithic app to a microservices architecture. Uh, they are not one in the same. It's not easy at all to uh, switch from one to the other um, just because the, uh, the design is very different. Uh, but microservices, uh, they 
as mentioned, they're smaller, more focused. They allow you to more easily kind of just develop individual parts and of your application independently and even deploy them independently because that's the actual intent behind it. So you've got multiple uh, bits of your application, of your greater application uh, deployed independently. So monitoring of those uh, is can be quite complicated. It's one of the age old uh problems with actually uh running systems and applications in production of how do you know when it's uh going wrong or gone wrong uh so one of the, one of the main ones which are, you're probably all familiar with is simply just the machine health of is it sat at 100 percent cpu usage is it sat at 100 percent um uh ram usage or has the uh, storage completely filled up uh, a lot of those metrics are actually provided uh, by the cloud providers, such as AWS. They frequently have uh, basic uh, uh, levels, which is normally free or just extremely cheap, which is quite literally the oh, it's set at 100% CPU usage. Uh, and then you've t uh, they typically provide um, more in in depth ones as well, uh, but. And those uh, in-depth ones typically have some sort of link into notifications, which is the second way of monitoring of, uh, A, you've, once you've got your monitoring set up, how do you actually know about it? How do you get notified of it? Uh, again, most of the cloud providers give some sort of notification system. And if they don't, um, one of the common ways is to just simply um, within the application server itself set up notifications as most have some form of emailing you uh, or otherwise notifying you. But uh, this leads me nicely into uh, the, from application service to the actual applications. Although, yes, the machine may be sat at 100% health, 100% uh, uh, usage, that's not necessarily uh, indicative of what the actual application uh state is of uh, it could be in a zombie state uh, or it could just simply have not have been deployed and something else has uh, kicked it off to 100% CPU usage such as our age-old favorite Windows updates if you're running Windows Server. Um, so there are various ways of monitoring uh, applications. You can literally just see the timeout of oh, it's not working when you hit the actual endpoint, uh, or it's just being extremely slow. So literally, you try to use the app and it's not there. It's a form of monitoring in a sense. Uh, I've already mentioned there's application server uh, metrics. This tends to be things like thread pools. Uh, so you've got a bit more fine-grained knowledge of what's happening, of uh, why your application is potentially not responding, such as the thread pools uh, are completely filled up. Uh, and those typically can be exported into third-party monitoring solutions, uh, such as uh, Prometheus or something like that, or Grafana, to give you a nice graphical view. Uh, and then obviously, you can just manually define the checks yourselves, either within the application or on the server itself, of just going, uh, just every, set up a cron job which pings it and then goes, oh, it didn't respond, send an email via bash script or whatever. But why bother with that when there's micro profiles? So again, a very quick background. Uh, micro profile was sorry, ice cream van going back. <laughs> uh, micro profile was an initiative uh, kicked off essentially because at the time J uh, Java or Oracle, uh, who owned Java EE, were being very slow in response to things and actually being quite opaque. Uh, essentially not telling anybody what they were doing and the whole process for actually contributing and uh, steering the direction was quite closed in. Uh, so that in initially kicked off micro profile as just kind of its own thing within Eclipse where uh, it's a lot easier and it's a lot quicker moving and it's not tied to Oracle. Uh, obviously, uh, Java EE has now moved over to Eclipse uh, and is now Jakarta EE. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean uh, that MicroProfile is moving back into it at all. Uh, if anything, the my uh, I've heard through the grapevine, it's very much going to be staying separate from J Jakarta EE. Uh, 
there are quite some strong opinions that it should remain separate. It should remain faster moving, uh, but still it keeps using it. For example, it uses uh, Jack Ceres uh, from Jakarta EE or Java EE. Um, so micro profile, it's as its uh, name alludes to, is very much designed around uh, uh, designed around giving uh, application developers an API, API various APIs for uh, actually developing micro applications for microservice architectures. One of these is MicroProfile Health, uh, which was although not all of them are designed for use in cloud and containerized environment, MicroProfile Health most definitely was. Uh, it's quite closely tied to Kubernetes and uh, the other cloud providers in that it gives you an API, uh, which uh, lets you define uh, various checks uh, that you can uh, trigger. So, uh, so it gives three different, at the moment, it gives three checks. Uh, in future, this will uh, probably go be dropping down to two. Of uh, It provides readiness checks, liveness checks, and then generic. It, they didn't really have a name. They were just called health checks. Uh, uh, but they were just generic. Those are the ones which are deprecated. Readiness checks are intended to be used uh, as essentially, is your application started? Is it running? Is it actually ready to be uh uh, begin servicing requests and uh, liveness is uh, as the name alludes to is just literally is the application still running is it still healthy is it alive uh, the generic ones uh, as which is why I call them generic they were they didn't have this distinction they were just literally generic ones uh, they they were accessed by poking uh, an endpoint uh, but with the introduction of readiness and liveness checks, that endpoint has been split into two uh, so that you can actually differentiate between the readiness and liveness checks. Although the functionality uh, is still there to just uh, run through all of the health checks uh, by hitting the original health endpoint. It's not been removed yet, um, which uh, kind of getting ahead of myself, the health API uh, although it's not on the actual application developer side, uh, those who implement the API have to expose an HTTP endpoint uh, or HTTPS if you want it to be secure, uh, which when you poke it, uh, it will run through all of the uh, health checks that you've defined within your application. So it will run through readiness checks, liveness checks, and the generic ones. Uh, originally, this was just the slash health endpoint, but now uh, you can, uh, specify specifically only run the readiness checks and specifically only run the liveness checks or get all of them still. So a little example, so rather than just me saying it, uh, here's a, I've written up a very, very basic uh, health check. I, I will specify this, you should not be writing a health check like this at all. Uh, I'll be using this in the demo today. But this essentially uh, you, Define your health check. You implement the health check interface uh, for your class. In the case of CDI scoping, uh, it needs to be scoped to CDI. So in this case, I've just done it as application scoped. And then depending on if you want it to be a liveness check or a readiness check, you annotate it with liveness or readiness. You can actually provide, uh, specify a check as being both. Uh, what that simply means is that if you hit the health ready uh, endpoint, uh, it will appear there, and also if you hit the health live endpoint, it will appear there as well. So the general way this API works, uh, aside from implementing that and uh, annotating it with liveness, uh, is as you can see here, you override this uh, one method, health check uh, call, which re returns a health check response object. Uh, you create a, using a response builder, you create your response, give it a name, define the state of it with uh, this method here, up or down, uh, and then you can provide additional data if you so wish, and then build it to return it. So rather than me just talking, I'll load it up here. So I've got it open in my browser here, uh, browser, IDE. So this with data method, 
Uh, it's not just string. If you wish, uh, you can provide uh, longs, booleans, or strings. Essentially, you can just fill it out with as much metadata as you want. Uh, and then the up is used to define that everything is healthy, uh, and down is used to define that everything is uh, down, essentially not healthy. Um, and then you build them. So this, as I said, you should not be having a health check like this because this is essentially, as the name implies, a coin flip. It just uh, creates a new random and just goes, <laughs> is it up or down? Essentially, essentially flipping by flipping a coin. Uh, more useful ones would be ones utilizing um, actual liveness checks around uh, did it respond within, uh, let's say, did it respond within five seconds or something like that? You can define that in your application or you could define that in the cloud of did it actually respond? So the original, uh, if you want to, if you're coming from uh, uh, the older versions of the API, there is still the health endpoint. As you can see there, it's crossed out because it's uh, deprecated. As I said, though, uh, this is the generic one. It is deprecated. Uh, the, this is essentially the equivalent of just defining it as both a, a liveness check and a readiness check. Let's read that again. So I've got that built. So if I deploy that, I'm going to uh, obviously I work at Payara. I'm going to be using Payara Micro. Uh, so I've already built it. I'm not going to bore you with showing me using Maven Clean install again. Uh, but I've downloaded Payara Micro. I set it no cluster because I don't need the clustering and make it load up quicker. Uh, set the context root to root so that it's just uh, I don't have to specify the application name and then deploy it. And then once that's started up should be able to go to request 8080. Let's start it up. Got the index there. And then the endpoint, as I mentioned, is under health. So if I hit health, this uh, would run through every single check. This would run through all liveness checks and all readiness checks. Uh, I've only got the one in this application, uh, but you, you can see here the coin uh, flip went well. I got ahead, essentially. Uh, so it's given a status of up. So this is in JSON as well. So uh, if you want to f uh, read through it using a JSON parser, you can, uh, which is the actual use of the metadata. Uh, so it's given a status of up. To run the check, so the name fragile, status up, data there. And if I just hit this a few more times, eventually the coin flip will come up tails. It shows down. So as mentioned, it, this is a liveness check. So uh, the endpoint specifically for checking liveness checks is health slash live. And ooh, from memory, I think it's ready. Yes. Um, the the endpoint for checking readiness checks is simply health slash ready, but I don't have any readiness checks, so it shows us up. So there is no way of uh, defi of specifically going. I only want to if I had multiple health checks. Uh, let's say I had a health check called uh, solid <laughs> rather than fragile. There is no way of me simply going, give me the liveness check called fragile, or give me the fr liveness check called solid. There is no way of doing that. The intent is not for you to be able to go through and manually go, what's that one doing? What's that one doing? What's that one doing? It is essentially a, a full, what is it? What is the state of the entire instance? Uh, the API as well was uh, designed around uh, not necessarily uh, supporting multiple applications, although it does in the case of PyroMicro. So uh, in the same manner that there's no way of going, give me all of the uh, liveness checks for uh, the application one and exclude uh, the other deployed applications. Uh, there is no way of doing that. It give, it searches through all the deployed applications and gives you uh, the runs the health checks for all of them. 
as I said, this is a micro. This is intended for microservice architectures. Uh, you're not necessarily meant to be uh, deploying multiple apps to the same application server in such environments. Mm -hmm. Nope, that one. So, missed the point as well. Uh, so, although it's not showing it here, just because of the fact that uh, I'm just poking it with a browser, the up requests uh, return HTTP 200 success, as you would expect. Uh, it's just you know, bog standard, it worked. The errors, though, so down. Uh, when it gives a status of down, this returns an HTTP 503, which hopefully we'll see later. Uh, but uh, that's it's just to say it's unavailable uh, if you don't re don't remember your HTTP status codes off the top of your head. Uh, I should also mention as well that uh, when it runs through all of the various status checks. Uh, it will only give an up state if all of them return true. So because I've only got one, uh, the, the general status of up will mirror what the uh, status of this one is here. But if you had three or four, the only way to be able to get a uh, overview aggregate status of up would be if all of them provide up. Uh, if one of them returns down, then the entire application is uh, determined to be unhealthy. So you need to bear that in mind when you're uh, defining your health checks uh, in that they need to, you need to be careful that you're not uh, necessarily including a fragile health check like this uh, when it doesn't necessarily need to be there. So I'm now gonna run through um, just a very, very very basic demo of setting up a, a uh, uh, an example in environment in AWS, showing off uh, as I said this application uh, of how to use the Health Live endpoint in the case of uh, load balances. I'm not going to be covering uh, doing anything clever such as. Um, removing dead instances and replacing them with uh, healthy ones. Uh, that's for further reading. I don't have, uh, that's not in the scope of this. This is purely just gonna be uh, the very basics of getting people started. So from uh, the AWS console, the very first step you need to do is simply actually create your AMI. Uh, because I'm going to be using auting scaling uh, and I want to define my AMI before I use it rather than uh, having it uh, uh, defining all the yum installs uh, per instance. So I'm going to launch an instance. Uh, going to use Amazon Linux. T2 Micro is perfectly fine for this. Only going to kick off one. Uh, going to kick it off into the VPC that we've just got for our dev stuff. Uh, auto assign a public IP. Essentially leave it mostly with the default settings. Uh, and then kick it off. So next, add storage. Again, that's fine. Give it a name just so I can find it. Uh, so we'll call it cloud. Oh, Uh, and then for a security group, I'm going to give it uh, one I made earlier. For those who weren't aware, the security groups are essentially just, um, uh, it's a firewall configuration, essentially, of you define what ports can access it from where. So in this case, I've, made, I've just made a very simple one of uh, port 80, so default HTTP can be accessed from anywhere. Uh, and also uh, port 8080 can also be accessed from anywhere. Uh, this is the default port that Pyron Micro starts on. And then just anywhere, uh, my IP address as well. Uh, so I can SSH in and etc. So I'm going to kick that off, launch now. Uh, and once again, here's one I made earlier. Uh, I've got an existing key pair rather than defining a new one. Uh, 
this is just so I can actually SSH in without having to specify passwords. So that should be starting now. I'll wait for that to start up. The IP address from there. Get ready. So I already downloaded the PEM earlier. It's just in my downloads folder. So I'm just going to SSH uh, using that PEM uh, and the default Amazon user of EC2 user to that IP address. It's not running, so hopefully I'll be able to. Nope, not there yet. A few more seconds. Once I'm in, uh, I'm essentially just going to be setting up my machine uh, as a template so I can actually create uh, all my other instances using this template. Uh, so to do that, I need to make an AMI, an Amazon machine image. So I'm just going to install all the things I need. In this case, I need Maven. So it's going to install Maven. Run through. And I'm also going to be installing Git and uh, Java 8. Uh, although it's installing Java 11 now, uh, just for the ease of this demo, I'm going to be using Java 8. PyroMicro does support Java 11, uh, but as I said, just for ease of use, I'm going to be using Java 8. So the reason I'm doing all this uh, is, although yes, I could set this up from Docker, um, I'm intending for every time I start this instance uh, for it to actually download the latest version of my application, uh, build it, and then deploy it. What do you got to have a demo? Clone my repo. This is currently just deployed to my personal um, account. At some point, I'll probably move it into the actual example repository of Pyro. Of Pyro. That shouldn't take long. It's, there's nothing to the application. Uh, I can quickly show you. It is very much nothing there. It's just a pure basic Maven application in the POM. Uh, I'm just grabbing down the Jakarta web API. So I've got access to uh, the various uh, CDI annotations. Uh, and then I'm also taking down specifically the health API because that's the only one I'm using. 2.1, the latest is 2.2, but PyroMicro doesn't support that yet. That's coming in the next release, hopefully. Uh, as I said, you could pull down all of them, but for this case, I'm only using health. So uh, this POM is just saying, I want the Jakarta Web API and MicroProfile Health. Specifying the packaging as WAS, because I want it as a web app, archive. The web XML, nothing there. It's just spe specifying the welcome file of index, which, as I showed you quickly earlier, it's just saying hello. Uh, and then uh, my health check there. There's nothing else to it. Good success. Now, I'm going to download PR Micro. Actually, deploy from it. 
hide it from Raven Central for now. Uh, and because I'm not going to try and remember how to type that, I'm just going to rename it to Pyro Micro. What I have there is essentially I've built the app and I've got that there. So let's just double check it all works. So Micro, Java, Java Micro, no cluster. Root of root, and then so I'll need to get the IP address from here again. Okay, oh, yeah, that's working. Perfect. But essentially, that is my template. So as I said, I could use Docker for this. Um, we do provide, uh, Pyara provides a base Pyara micro Docker image, uh, which is essentially just uh, the Git repo is here. Pyara Docker, Pyara Micro is on Docker Hub. You don't have to necessarily build it yourself. Uh, but if you do want to deploy your own application, this is probably better to build your own thing and doing so is really simple although yes you could uh, take the full docker file and edit it to your heart's content you can also just extend it by doing from pyr micro and then copy your application into the deployment directory and then it will automatically deploy it the reason i'm not do using that is uh because as i said I'm intending for this to be building the latest version of my application each time, and that's not in the spirit of Docker. The Docker instance, uh, Docker images are meant to be fairly uh, static. You're not meant to be building things within them each time. They are meant to be immutable, as it as it was. So now that I've got that, I'm going to stop it because I want to make my AMI from it. So let that stop. Mm -hmm. There we go. So I don't want to go to actions, image. Yes, image. Uh, create an image. So I give it a name of health cloud demo. We're going to give it a description because I'm only using it for this. Uh, keep that and create the image from it. This just means rather than uh, me spinning up the new instance and um, having to do that each time or within the startup parameters of the instance, um, specifying that, I, I can just literally have it as that. So this can potentially make uh, the actual startup time of your instances quicker because uh, they're not having to manually install Java, uh, Maven, Git, and then build your application or even download your application. Uh, that's typically another issue you have. If your application, for example, is, uh, let's just say, two gigabytes in size, um, if you're just using the startup scripts, uh, uh, if you're just uh, defining your instances to start uh, and download that application, you've, each time you start a new instance, you've got to download that that two gigabyte application. Uh, that will slow down your internet uh, or the startup time of your instances. Because uh, although yes, Amazon have big fat pipes, uh, where you're hosting it may not necessarily have big fat pipes. Downloads are two-way. Um, so now that I've got my AMI, I'm going to create a, la a launch template. 
So create a launch template here. Uh, this is, again, uh, very much in the same manner as um, uh, the AMI. Uh, this just lets me define various things so I don't have to define them each time. So define a name in my AMI. I want to search for my AMI I just created there. Instance type. Uh, if you want to specify the instance type, you can either let it define it itself. Uh, in this case, I'm going to keep it as the same. Keep, uh, let's keep my original one just in case I need to log into them. VPC, yep, I'll leave it where it was. I'm not going to select a security group there. I'm instead going to add a network interface just so it's got one. Specify that I want it in the public IP to be enabled. Uh, and then what I will do actually is grab the name of it. So that should be taking my notes. Yep. Uh, and I also want to specify that I want to use this for auto scaling, just to double check that everything's perfect. Yep. So although, yes, I said I wasn't going to um, define that I'm going to download everything, I am still going to run a startup script so that each time one of these instances starts, I don't need to necessarily um, start kicking off uh, PyR Micro like I just did. So I'm just going to copy paste from my notes rather than type it out to save time. But I will run through it. Uh, so just going to run a bash script. Very simple. Can I resize this? Yes. Good. So. Not the nicest bash script by any means, but it'll do the job. So uh, use the specify as bash, uh, move to the home directory, move into the uh, git repo I've already cloned down, uh, pull, from or, uh, pull from origin master just to make sure it's up to date and got the latest version, build it, move back up, and then deploy it to Pyara Micro. So I'm going to create the new launch template there. So now that I've got that, I could start kicking off applications. Alternatively, I'm going to create an auto-scaling group. Uh, before I actually start creating auto-scaling groups, I am going to make a load balancer, however. So if I go back to EC2, go to load balancers, and start creating one, ignore that one. So I want to make an application load balancer, uh, just because I don't need any of the other things that the web application one gives. So give it a name. It's internet facing, IPv4. Uh, I want to specify, yep, that is defined as a port. Uh, I don't need. I don't want to have to specify anything else. As this is the load balancer side. Uh, if I was specifying port 8080, it would just means whenever I uh, hit the load balance URL, I'd be having to specify 8080. I don't want no one to do that. What I want to be doing is just hitting it as I normally would and then moving directly from that uh, to forwarding to the port I want. Uh, so, yep, keep it in that VPC. And then I'm just going to specify that I want it available in all uh, availability zones for this uh, EU West area. So, no, and in this case, I don't want HTTPS. Security group, again, I want Jakarta Tech Talk uh, so that I can actually talk to it. Uh, if you remember, I was opening port 8080 and port 80. This is important uh, because if port 8080 wasn't open uh, or whichever port Pyara Micro was running on, uh, this demo wouldn't work because I wouldn't actually be able to hit the, the health endpoint or even hit the application. They configure routing. As I mentioned, I want it to forward from port 80 to 8080. I want to make a new target group. Instance. And then here's 
where I'm going to start talking about the health checks. So this is health checks for the load balancer. What this means is that I'm going to specify on that port 8080, uh, traffic port there, which is that port specified. If I wanted to, I could override it, uh, but because I'm only using that one point, it's fine. Uh, just because I wanted to hit all of the endpoints, even though if there's only one. The way this will work is uh, if I spin up multiple instances, what will happen if one of them starts reporting as unhealthy is uh, essentially the load balancer will stop forwarding to that instance. Uh, so if I have three instances and one of them is proving to be unhealthy, uh, as you would expect a load balancer to do, this will mean it's no longer, uh, it will stop forwarding requests to that instance. So rather than relying on any um, uh, third party health things or uh, configuring anything on the uh, machine itself or configuring anything within AWS, I'm just going to tell it to go to the health endpoint. And then as part of my normal app development, I've written the health check that I want where I can actually access uh, the internals of my application. So for example, uh, if I'm, uh, let's say I had a, a fixed bound array and for some reason I wanted a health check of just going that array is now too big, uh, start reporting down, I can actually access that array. Again, that's a very bad example, don't do that. <laughs> but the option is there if you do want to do it. So the healthy threshold is the number of consecutive health checks that once something is considered unhealthy for it to become healthy again. Uh, as I said, this is not uh, dealing with uh, replacing unhealthy instances. This is simply just uh, marking instances, whether they're available for talking or not. So unhealthy, so I'm going to leave it generally with these uh, defaults. So once something is marked as unhealthy, it needs to get five coin flips in a row. Uh, to be marked as healthy again, and to be marked as unhealthy, it needs to get two bad coin flips. Uh, this will probably end up uh, just showing um, potentially as unhealthy uh, due to the fact that um, uh, it is literally a coin flip. So I'll leave that there. So interval, interval, all the uh, help information is there as well, and Amazon have quite good uh, uh, documentation and the options for uh, Kubernetes, uh, not Kubernetes, sorry, Azure, uh, are roughly similar as well. They are slightly different, but they're roughly the same. So success codes, if I wanted to, I could specify extra ones, but I just want it as 200. So I leave that there with just the targets. I want to, have I forgotten this step? I've forgotten a step somewhere. Damn it. Ah. Uh, probably because I should have actually made my auto scaling group first. So, uh, what I'm doing here, I'm just going to start creating my auto scaling group. So, create auto scaling group. So, I went to template, selected the template actions, went to here. So I give it a name. Come back to that load balancer in a second. I think I've done things slightly out of order. Well, I'll just create the load balancer with nothing. Okay. So, uh, Selecting the template version, uh, the way uh, Amazon works is you can actually keep referencing uh, different versions of your launch template. So by default, it picks the default. Uh, the default does not change, however. It, the default is not necessarily the latest. Uh, default is just by default, the very first one there. If you want to change the default or only use the latest, either pick latest or change your default each time. So adhere to the launch template. Uh, I'm going to start with three instances uh, in the network there. I'm going to specify each of the subnets. Although it only says subnet, uh, it does let you pick all the subnets. 
Uh, and then in here, I want to receive traffic from load balances. I probably need to refresh because it hasn't picked up my other one. There we go. I did do it out of order. So the health check grace period, this is uh, in the case where you are specifying, I want to download a big two gigabyte thing. Uh, obviously that will take some time. Uh, I'm not doing that so I can set the health check period to much lower. I'm going to set it to just a minute. So now I'll set it to 30 seconds. I shall trust in Amazon to start quickly. Uh, and it's precision don't care about. Scaling policies, uh, as I said, I'm not going to be configuring any uh, fancy removing uh, dead instances or uh, going uh, this instance is running at too high uh, of a CPU utilization. So spin up a new one. I'm just going to leave it as three, three and three. So fixed size. Not going to have any notifications. This is what I mentioned previously of if something's going wrong, uh, I can send notifications about various things. So in this case, in the case of auto scanning group, I can send emails to uh, um, if any of these things are happening there, of if, if it's killed one of the instances or one of the instances is failing to launch. So let's just give it an, a name so I can keep track of it. Policies none, notifications none, tags none. Da, 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 da. Yep. Create that auto scaling group. Now, hopefully, if I look back at this load balancer, yep, there we go. It's forwarding. Uh, to my Cloud Health demo target group from port 80. And this will soon, hopefully, start getting various instances. It doesn't have any at the moment. But if I go to auto scaling groups, I've got this one here that I've got three instances. Minim uh, I want three instances. I've got uh, minimum of three, maximum of three, and desired of three. This is to do with the scaling uh, due to the fact that I'm, as I said, I want to be uh, fixed. I've got that there. So if I hopefully look at instances, I will be getting, yeah, three cloud health demos coming into focus now. So if I go back to the low. No, no, it is here. Uh, so once these have started, uh, it will start poking the health endpoint as I specified here every um, 30 seconds, saying that every five seconds, if something's gone wrong, uh, uh, giving it a five second timer. And eventually, once they've started up and the health checks have started going, we should hopefully, so 503, oh, they've all gone unhealthy. 503 is probably the fact that it ha hasn't got there yet. So because of the fact that I am, as I've mentioned, doing a coin flip, this is the version of the application I'm using as well. So uh, it's a slightly weighted coin flip, but uh, it is still essentially a coin flip. Uh, and the fact that I set the health checks to be quite harsh, of I need it to pass f five times in a row, uh, it will be quite hard for it to move out of the unhealthy state. So what I will do, just for demonstration, it's changed that. So you can change these on the fly. Change that down to not timeout. Well. But if I go to instances, they should now be running. Yes, they are. They should hopefully be accessible. Go to health. 
So, as I mentioned, this will poke it each time. If I check my targets again, ah, they're not being, they're not playing ball. They're remaining unhealthy. Five or two is interesting. It should be a five or three. I don't know what five or two is getting that from. Uh, but what this means essentially is because they, all of these are unhealthy, if I actually go to the load balancer and try to uh, access the access it, it'll essentially just give me uh, nothing's there. Oh, no, it did find one. That's good. I'm healthy now. Yeah, there we go. They're being healthy now. Because I loosened it. If I'd hit it before, it would have given a five or three unavailable. So that was a very quick look at that. As I said, that is the pure basics. Um, that's not intended for anything like production use. That is just pure demo cross fingers. And it did work. Only a couple of hiccups. So further usages, as I meant, uh, obviously this is not just limited to AWS, just for pure time uh, constri uh, restrictions. Uh, that's all I had time to very quickly show in such uh, detail. Uh, but it, this should uh, definitely work. In fact, no, it do, not should work. It does work in Azure. Uh, and there are uh, options in Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. Uh, the readiness checks in particular, uh, the or the differentiation between liveness and ready check, uh, readiness checks, that comes more into focus in Kubernetes and Docker Swarm, uh, where they actually have uh, separate checks for that of going, is the container actually up and ready and serving stuff? Uh, because of the fact that those uh, sometimes in the case of Kubernetes particularly, uh, depending on the way that's managing its um, containers, sometimes it will have to potentially download those containers first, which can take some time, uh, getting all the layers and stuff. Uh, but as I said, the readiness checks and the liveness checks, that's more uh, focused at Kubernetes. Uh, you can use them in some capacity in AWS and Azure, uh, but that's not what they are most pointed at. The readiness and liveness checks are most pointed at Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. So as I've mentioned multiple times in this as well, uh, you can automatically replace unhealthy instances. That is probably one of the main usages uh, for it, along with uh, avoiding the unhealthy instances. Uh, if I didn't have, if I wasn't using the slash health endpoint, I'd have to be providing some other means uh, of telling the load balancer um how to know if it's healthy so uh uh just in a very dumb way uh you could have uh, i could have not had it uh directed at the health the health patch i could have had it just pointed straight at this um index page and gone uh that got a server 500 error that didn't work and use that as the health that's quite a uh a brutal and dumb check, though, of just going, is the application working, yes or no? With the uh, health checks with liveness and readiness, uh, you've got more flexibility and more control over how that works, particularly uh, if you start using multiple li uh, liveness checks. As I mentioned, you can specify multiple ones. Uh, but you can combine it with uh, the machine health and various other metrics. As I mentioned, you can access things within your application. So you could say, uh, can the application itself contact the database that you've got? Uh, can it do a ping? Can it do a get? Is it actually returning data? Uh, because uh, you can, uh, being CDI scoped, uh, it's got full access to all the other beans and stuff. Uh, so you can check if your beans are actually returning things. Uh, as mentioned, uh, you can combine it with machine health. You can either uh, separate, combine that separately um, of define on the uh, in AWS or in your cloud provider general of just is it sat at 100% CPU usage for five seconds? Okay, that's wrong. But then also have this. Alternatively, you could use one of the other microprofile specifications. Uh, the Metrics is the one that comes to mind. This is specifically around getting that information, such as CPU usage and stuff. So within your uh, health check, 
I don't have the dependencies downloaded at the time. But I could uh, get the metrics registry within my health check here uh, and start doing those calls and querying the um, the machine state, but also the application state, because the metric micro profile metrics is not purely limited to um, the uh, machine metrics. It does give you access to other things as well, such as how frequently how uh, how frequently something is being hit, among other things as well gives you quite a vast of amount of uh, different metrics that you can query from here. Uh, metrics is another one that actually uh, exposes an HTTP endpoint as well. So depending on how you want to run it, you could uh, ping the endpoint and see what you get back from there. Um, but yeah, that's a very quick an overview of microprofile health. Uh, and some of the ways that you could be using it uh, in there. So I've covered a brief overview of cloud and microservices and what microprofile health is, run through a very quick demo of setting it up in AWS, and giving you some further usages. And that was almost to time, five, six, six minutes under, but pretty much. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, does anybody have any questions or anything else? Ooh because that was me done. So there is a, oh, sorry, I, I wasn't seeing this. Very difficult to see. Oh, somebody's done something. Good. All right, so if no one else has any questions or comments, thank you everyone for coming and hope I you I see enjoyed. one from Arian of, hello Arian, by the way. Uh, Endpoint health security is now propriety. Do you think it sh should be moved to the microprofile spec? Uh, is it propriety? As, as in things around HTTPS? Ooh. I think that should probably, personally, I think that probably should be moved to the uh, microprofile spec. That sounds like something that should probably belong under there. Of Although, yes, this is uh, microprofile health as I mentioned way back at the start, it is intended for use uh, more by things such as AWS. Um, oh, there's actually, yeah, the authentication. Um, I lost my train of thought now. But start again. Uh, yes, I do think it should be under there uh, because although uh, if this health is intended for use purely by things such as AWS and Kubernetes, um, uh, you don't necessarily, if in the case of, uh, as I had in this example, have the uh, uh, IP public, uh, you don't necessarily want everybody else to be able to check the state of your application, particularly if you're sending set, uh, sensitive metadata over the wire, because you can add anything you want in there. So if you're being a bit thick and sending your passwords as plain text, uh, that should be protected. And yes, by default, uh, the health endpoint is not uh, protected. Um, there, uh, in Pyara, yes, we uh, do support having that under HTTPS, and you can also um, actually protect that further with um, uh, log on information uh, as uh, basic Java security stuff. Um, if you're talking specifically around uh, the actual Java security stuff, uh, protection of it, um, interesting question. I'm going to say, no, I don't think that should probably be in there. Uh, if nothing else, just because then you're starting to um, bleed over specs a bit. Uh, you do, as mentioned, although yes, there is the, avail the possibility of you checking the information yourself. Uh, when you start bringing in authentication, particularly for things such as, uh, do you have the user rights to access this endpoint? Uh, that can get quite complicated when you're starting to use that in Kubernetes and other environments. So although, yes, I, I like the option of having it there, I don't necessarily think it should be a part of the actual specification or if it is an optional part of the specification. All right, perfect. Is there any more questions or comments? I'll give uh, people time to write in the chat if there are any. 
I saw people complaining about my resolution. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to up the size of the text before this, but uh, obviously I can't check for everything. And I wasn't checking the chat. Sorry. Well, uh, so thank you everyone for coming out. Hope you had a great time. And you can contact Andrew through his Twitter, other social media channels, and this will be up live on YouTube tomorrow. Thank you, everyone.